order of things. Nope. Okay. Go on. Welcome, everybody. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Is there any public invited to her? Any public? No? No public? Okay, then the minutes from the last meeting were distributed before the meeting. Are there any changes to the minutes? Anybody has? Without any changes, is there a motion to approve? I move to I move to approve. Second. So, Grant steps in on the second, okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the minutes are approved. And uh, before we go into our next agenda item, I just wanted to thank Madeline for the invitations to all of the uh, MLK activities. I was able to make the one at Silver Creek, and it was really wonderful. Awesome. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. And I was able to go to the one at Second Baptist, that, and it was great. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, so let's move on to agenda item four, redesignate permanent posting location for the 2020 Housing and Human Service Advisory Board agendas. Now that construction is complete, I used the west entrance. It was, it was bad Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, besides council chambers, it's totally done besides that last piece, right? No? No? There's so this just, just that. that. Just that. Piece There's more. Yeah. Okay. Right. But so, so um, just to clarify, so what we can do now is to go back to the official posting place, if you so choose, which would be at the west entrance right. to the mall area. Now that it is back open, and it has been on the north, the north. entrance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's do this. Let's first. Is there? Anybody who would like to see it relocated back to the west entrance, and if so, let's make a motion. I'm going to move that we uh, redesignate the permanent posting location to this uh, west entrance. Here. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Now, any discussion on whether that is a good idea or not? Where is the west entrance? It's the one here that's west. been under construction. West. <laughs> it's to the yeah. west. The one, the one that we could come in up to a year and a half ago. Oh, oh yeah. Where the, the, goose, the goose is? The goose entrance? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the goose entrance, okay. right. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I call it. Okay, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yes. Is there any concern that moving it there sort of in the middle of the year is going to be confusing since not everyone knows that you can now enter there? Uh, we've been posting it at the other, door. the door by the library, right? Yes. Mm. Yes. And for the past many years, it's always been at the West End. So yeah, so I think. Could we have just a note, a sign there saying for agendas, please see the West Entrance? Uh, just so I think there is some direction that if somebody's like. Yeah. Well, I would think that if you keep it posted, I mean, if you change it to the West Entrance, for a couple of months, we can certainly uh, tape up a, an that, agenda. That's, yeah. That would yep. be my only we can make that informal. Just for some yes. short period of time. Very informal. A, a forwarding address left a for, the, yeah, we the can, old house. <laughs> 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 we just might, you know, just push, put it up there just for a couple okay. of months. If that, if that works. Yeah. That would be okay. Okay. Right. Does that address your concerns? Yeah. Okay, any no, other no. discussion? Mm -hmm. Okay, then let's go ahead and vote on relocating the agendas to the west entrance. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and we have relocation for the permanent housing, uh, permanent posting location. Ooh. All right, on to agenda item five, reviewing the 2019 CDBG performance report. And I believe everybody did receive that report in their packet. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're going to walk us through yep. as well? <coughs> All right. Yeah. Oh. Sure. All right. So this is a um, requirement of the Community Development Block Grant Program, or CDBG program. And then we usually tack on the Affordable Housing Program and Home Program if we have received funds um, in that current year. 
um, to give an update. So this goes out to the public and for comment, it's actually out right now for public comment, um, a 30-day notice, 30-day um, period for public comment. Council will have a public hearing on March 17th, which is next Tuesday. You're getting a little sneak preview before they see it. Um, and <coughs> um, it is due to HUD by March 31st. Um, is when we have to submit it. So um, I will go through. We are and can we be clear mm -hmm. that what you're about to show us was not in our act? Correct. Just, oh, just finished the it memo today. Was, but, um, <laughs> um, so the primary um, program that we operate with CDBG funds is our housing rehab program, and that's made up of four different programs, the general rehab program, architectural barrier removal, um, mobile home repair program, and the emergency grant. So on the general rehab program, we make loans which are either deferred until a home sells or is refinanced or um, it, sometimes they're a repayment loan if the incomes of the <coughs> homeowners are um, above 50% of your immediate income um, to help improve the home. And it's prioritized to address code violations, health safety issues, make energy efficiency improvements, and then other things that the homeowner might want to have done. The maximum um, amount that can be borrowed is $25,000. Um, and <clears throat> in 2019, we spent a total of $140,865 on this program. We assisted seven households at an average cost of $20,123. And this just shows um, a couple of the improvements. So on this particular um, home, we did um, some kitchen work. Um, the floors were also really bad, as you can see in the top, whatever that is, right? <laughs> um, and so we put in new, um, um, well, it's um, like uh, laminate. Pergo, laminate, thank you. I skipped Pergo, but they it's don't laminate. want that anymore. Um, <laughs> so, and there was other improvements that were made to this home as well. Um, and then also, um, here's just shows another home. It's the same home. Um, we recited it, um, put on a new roof. Um, they had some porch improvements and some interior improvements as well. So just to give you kind of an idea. <coughs> Makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, on the mobile home repair program, um, we provide grants to low and moderate income home mobile home owners to help them keep their home safe and to prolong the useful life of the mobile home. We spent a total of $126,600 um, on this program in 2019. We did a lot of hot water furnace replacements in mobile homes, a lot of window replacements, which makes um, it more energy efficient, um, roof repairs and um, weatherization updates. Um, we assisted 17 households in 2019 at an average cost of 7,400, uh, just under 7,400. <coughs> and then on the architectural barrier removal program, um, these can be a grant or a loan um, to low and moderate income homeowners or to renters um, to make the home accessible for mm -hmm. the occupants. Um, we did do things like um, upgrading or do installing ADA toilets, ramps, um, we do a lot of tub conversions to walk-in showers or roll-in showers, and we also do um, can do flooring if there's tripping hazards for folks in um, walkers, et cetera. And also, we do a lot of, um, of these um, to help seniors that are, they may not have a formal disability, but to keep them in their home. <coughs> um, 13 households were assisted this year at an average cost of about 4,700 and a total of 61 if I didn't say that already, um, was spent on this program. And then on the emergency grant program, this is where we can go in one time um, and do a, a, a grant for a low moderate income homeowner to have make repairs that are a health and safety hazard um, or a, a serious or immediate threat to their, um, their safety. Um, we spent a total of $8,000 on this. Um, we did hot water and furnace replacements, electrical repairs, and some water and sewer issues were um, fixed. Six households were assisted at an average cost of $1,300. <coughs> so in total rehab program assistance, um, we spent over $380,000. 43 households were assisted 
Um, if you add up all the ones that I just talked about, it adds up to more than 43 because people can get more than one grant or, or type of assistance at one time. Um, so the average cost was about $8,800 for those 43 households that were assisted. This is a decrease in volume from 2018. Um, we actually spent 455,000 in 2018. We assisted slightly more households, 40, um, at a slightly um, lower average cost than, than in 2018. We are still struggling with having sufficient um, contractors, number of contractors to bid um, on the job, which is slowing us down. It takes jobs longer to be completed and we have to mul uh, have multiple bids for each job. We keep trying to reach out. We put um, all of our bids on the state's bidding website and direct folks there. Um, we're trying, gonna try and do um, here in 2020 an outreach to all of the licensed contractors the city has on file. Um, see if we can winnow those down a little bit because obviously home builders aren't gonna wanna, <laughs> wanna do this. That would be a waste, but trying to figure out if there's some way we can try and increase the, the pool that we have. Kathy, may I ask a mm -hmm. couple of questions real yep. quick? So the city of Longmont, your staff hires and manages the contractors yes. for these projects. Mm -hmm. uh, given that it's harder to find contractors, I would have expected the price to go up on average just because they charge more because there's fewer of them. So are the nature of the repairs changing? or are you, what, how, Your average price for 2019 is lower than 2018? Um, I think probably if I went back and looked, there might be fewer, um, or there might have been more general recaps that were done in 2018, which okay. is the higher cost one, is my guess. Um, but uh, we also, so when we go into a job um, and look at what needs to be done, we do a cost estimate, um, and then the bids have to be within 15%. They can't go be more than 15% over that cost oh, okay. estimate. So that's also sometimes why we have to rebid it. Um, if something's out of whack, sometimes we have to go back and take things off. And say, Sorry, we can't do this. It's, you know, you, know, you really want your floors replaced, but we have to focus on this in order to get it done and under the cost estimate, that kind of thing as okay. well. So, thank you. Yep. I have a, uh -huh. um, sort of along the same lines, um, do, are you, um, I don't know if you know this with the contractors in the city, if we're seeing, if we've seen an increase or decrease in like permits filed. So if we are seeing sort of these bids for these going down, is that because contractors are busy enough with other things that they're not wanting to bid through the city? Or is there some, um, is there any outreach to determine sort of like why a contractor might not be bidding on some of these projects? Yeah, I, I mean, I think when we've looked before, it's been because we lost a lot of um, construction workers in the recession. They haven't come back. Um, they may be starting to, but wages are high. With the, um, with the floods as well, maybe. Right. Um, people who were the main contractors have found other things to do. Um, and it's much more um, financially beneficial to do um, rehab on a higher income homeowner's home. <laughs> And direct when you don't have to bid it. You, well, I mean, you might have to bid it, but you don't have all the other federal requirements that we have. They have to register for a DUNS number, which can take some time. They have to be licensed. They, you know, there's all kinds of requirements. They have to have insurance, et cetera, which hopefully regular folks are doing that as well. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's just been it, it's just been tight. Here. It, is there a way you can advertise to to contractors to let them know that? that's out there? I mean, there might be new people that come in that aren't aware that they could go to the city and figure that out, or, I mean, is there a way we could uh, advertise for contractors? I don't know. Yes, we can put an ad in the paper or something like that, or we can um, use social media or the website or something. Um, we haven't found that to be successful in the past, but okay. obviously we could, we could try I it again I just was curious, see. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, usually folks who are interested in doing the work are um, um, pretty hooked in with like the bid net services that I talked about at the state, um, or they don't want that level, they don't want to have to do that, <laughs> and they're more on the, um, not the Craigslist, but the home advisors, that kind of thing, um, and they don't want the additional federal responsibilities, but 
all the rules and regulations. I have another question. I have um, we we obviously helped more households in 2019. Um, did you find that there were a lot that because we couldn't get bids or anything like that that we had to turn down for these grants or or loans to be able to do work that they that they thought needed was needed. Um, yes, so we did have a couple that, um, I'm trying to think, maybe three last year, that we tried multiple times to bid their, their work and didn't get any sufficient bids, and so they chose to not move forward and figure out a different way to go, okay. or decided not to have the work done. Um, they can reapply at any time, or they can reactivate their application at any time. Um, but yeah, we did have that. We don't um, really advertise the program. It's mostly word of mouth so that we don't generate more interest than what we can we can do. Um, but we are also trying to grow the program and do more. <laughs> I was going to say three, three out of you know 46 seems like a relatively low rate that we're not meeting the need that's coming in. But obviously, there's probably need that we're not seeing if we're not yeah. advertising yeah. the program. Yeah. OK. Yeah. That's helpful to know. Thank that's you. <laughs> um, okay, so then the other things that we funded in um, 2019 um, was a grant to the Boulder County Housing Housing Program um, in the amount of 50000 They actually spent a little bit less, $47,500. Um, 288 residents um, used their programs, which include um, classes as well as required one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions when somebody is going to get a down payment assistance loan or a rehab loan or want to refinance their house um, or have some kind of issue, which we've seen before where we've, they've had a loan and we've decided to defer it or whatever, they have to go to the housing counselors and, and talk through. Um, the classes center around um, also foreclosure prevention. Um, they will work one-on-one -on -one with folks that are, that are going through that. Um, the classes are generally around home ownership, um, preparing for home ownership, um, preparing, um, preparing to be a renter isn't the right word, but um, um, being a good renter, <laughs> um, and how to increase your credit um, score and what to do to to position yourself to be in a better position um, budget wise as well as if you ever do want to move into home ownership. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, we just got noticed that they have suspended their classes because of coronavirus right now. So <coughs> we'll wait and see what happens. Nice, nice so accent that. on that. <laughs> 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 um, At some point, we have to laugh about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> laugh or go crazy. Um, and then the other thing that we um, allocated funding for was the security deposits to support. Um, local um, funded vouchers and additional um, housing authority vouchers um, that help the folks being referred for housing that come out of um, Homeless Solutions for Boulder County. We set aside 8,500 in 2019 and we're just getting to the point of being able to contract for those services now so we'll hit it hard in 2020 and actually we'll, it works out better we'll be able to do a contract um, one contract to for both 2019 funding and 2020 funding. And CBE, the HUD doesn't have an issue with those funds being spent in 2020 no. instead of 2019. No. That line up there on the um, slide that says leveraged 364000 uh -huh. what does that mean? So the Boulder County Housing Counseling Program got that much additional money from other funding sources. So City of Boulder contributes, the state contributes, mm. private um, banks contribute to their program, so that is the amount that leveraged. Now, that all that wasn't leveraged in Longmont, but if the program itself leveraged that. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So some of the comparisons um, on um, triggers, I guess, or um, goals that we have to meet. So we had a 33.4% expenditure ratio. This is not good. Um, we were at 50% in 2018, so what this means is of the funds that we had committed and what we spent, we only spent 33% of what we have committed and available to us in 2019. Mm. And you're going to see the ramifications of that. Um, in 2019, our timeliness ratio was 1.43, 
we're required to be one uh, below 1.5, so we did meet that. <coughs> what that means is that at a certain time point in our fiscal year, HUD checks and we can't have any more than one and a half times our grant amount in our letter of credit at HUD. So you have to be below that 1.5. We were at 1.43. Last year we were at 1.24 at that checkpoint. So that, we didn't do a good job on that either. <laughs> we leveraged 64 cents for every $1 spent in CDBG funds. It was 53% or 53 cents in 2018, so that's a little bit better. 14.6% of our 2019 funding was spent on administration. The cap, um, the top amount that HUD allows is 20%, so we were below that. So on one standpoint, that's good. On the other standpoint, I'd like it to be at 19, so we're getting at least as much as we can um, coming from the CDBG program. And then 98.9% of our funding spent in 2019 benefited low and moderate income residents. And um, we were at 87.4% in 2018, and the requirement is 70%, so we were way above that. <coughs> Who else would it benefit? Like, what is that, like in 2018, that 13%? I think what brought us down in 2018. So it's um, some of your programs, so like the housing counseling program, they can assist people over 80% area median okay. income. Um, I can't remember what we funded in 2018 that it was something that, that might have been an ur not an urgent need, but a slum light activity or just had a lower percentage of um, folks that were non low moderate income. What's the threshold for moderate on AMI? What's that? The 80%? Is 80% where the top of moderate yeah. lives? So. Yeah. So financially speaking, this kind of shows um, where we stood or how we progressed through the year. So on the far, this way, <laughs> um, is the 2018 unexpended funds we brought into 2019, wow. and then uh, which is 671,800. Then we got 622,900 in our CDBG grant for 2019. Um, the big number, which kind of is what <coughs> threw us over, was we got 402,000 in program income. We anticipated 50,000. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we got about 50,000 in regular program income. So we got 300,000 at the very end of 2019 from a loan, a couple loans. When Thistle repaid some of their loans, when we loaned them even more money, but they repaid. So that came in at the very end of the year. So that threw us way off whack because we didn't have time to spend it, allocate it or spend it. So which left us with, um, at the end of the year, 362000 in funds not allocated. That is that extra program income. So we had budgeted at $1.3 uh, in um, funds in, in 2019. Uh, we spent 566400 which leaves us at the end of 2019 with $1.1 million unspent. Yeah, I'm just trying to, so you have in income between unexpended funds, this, the grant program income, you have about 1.7 million. Um, and then the funds not allocated, that is 2019 funds, or those are the, the next column over? The uh, funds not allocated? The funds not allocated or the program? Uh, are, are this, yes, so. Please. Yep. Yes, so funds not allocated means they haven't been assigned to a project. Unexpended means they were assigned but not actually spent. Okay. Uh, so that would suggest they are going to be spent at some point in time. Yeah, they're okay. allocated for time. So, so it's a timing issue. Yes. Primarily. So what this shows is those unspent funds and where they're at. <coughs> So this is hard for you guys to see, but this is the um, funding for rehab project delivery. So this is our cost to um, manage the rehab program. This is the general rehab. So we have a lot of funds committed for that program, Three, over 350,000. Um, this is how much we spent is the red, and the green is what was 
left unspent at mm -hmm. the end of 2019. So really what this, sh so that's the general rehab. This is architectural barrier. This is mobile home repair. This is the emergency grant program. This is the utility deposit, um, security deposit for HSBC. This is the in-between Terry Street project um, that we awarded. And then this is Aspen Meadows refinance and rehab project that we awarded. So what this shows us is that the mobile home repair is the only program where we spent more than we left unspent. <laughs> so that one is doing fairly well. Obviously, we need to get the rehab funding out into the community. All of the rehab programs unspent count, account for $452,400. Um, so part of the problem is we did not receive our grant agreement until September. So we didn't. Shutdown. I'm sorry. Was that because of the shutdown? I don't think they shut down in 2019. That was 2018 oh. or. And, and that's the grant agreement from yeah, CDBG HUD. and HUD right. to it's actually. Calendar year. It's a calendar year. Yeah, so we're supposed to get our money in January. We got it in September. They awesome. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe some staffing issues there at HUD, know, or who it's, knows? It's been a trend for how many years now? Uh, longer than we thought, because when I went back and looked, I think it's almost 15. Wow. And it okay. seems like it gets. Later in the budget, so the projects, um, the HSBC and the Terry Street project in between, and the Aspen Meadows um, refi, those could not begin even until late fall. So that accounted for three hundred and five thousand. So that's seven hundred and fifty-seven thousand of the one point one million that was left unspent. And then we received that over 300000 in program income at the very end of 2018. So it makes up another 300 of that one point. Yeah, it gets to that one point. So you've got about 700 approximately right there. And are contractors also changing your timeline? I mean, you're just not able to get the work done in a timely fashion? Well, that's part of what's hampering the rehab program. Yeah. Um, the in-between has went ahead and they were able to bid the work, so they should start here pretty soon. Mm -hmm. um, we just couldn't get them under contract, and they couldn't sign a contract with their contractor. So, yep, it could, could be bad. I have a question, <coughs> sort of, kind of going back to that advertising. Um, you mentioned some of the challenges for contractors. Um, are the limits on these funds such that the city couldn't, so, you, so like if um, a contractor doesn't have like the DUNS number, I think that you said, or some of the things that are required for federal um, <coughs> approval through HUD, are these funds limited in such a way that we couldn't help contractors do some of those things? Um, we do help them. Okay. So we will sit down and help them go online and it doesn't cost them to get the oh, okay. number. It's just a timing thing. And sometimes it takes a while for, because it goes to the federal government, to get processed. <laughs> um, and it isn't, um, it's not complicated, but it's not the most intuitive process. So yes, we will sit down with them and help them get it. Got it. Um, you know, they're on their own to get the insurance that's required um, and to get their license. Um, we try and... <coughs> use a general contractor as much as possible because their subs don't necessarily have to be licensed. Um, they carry, you know, obviously the liability yeah. for all of that. Um, so that's a, a way we've done it because we've talked about do we start acting as the general in order to get more, you know, people bidding and more trades involved, but they still have to have the duns and then they're going to have to have insurance and everything because we don't, we're not a licensed contractor to do that. So um, that's, doesn't help much. Yeah. So. Yeah, I just wondered, like, you know, if the city had a, a, gen, a an outside general contractor, but like we could help support them with their insurance costs so that then they would be licensed and insured to then bring in subs, but it, that might get a little too, like, closely held for, like, these yeah, grant funds, um, I'm mean, assuming. There are programs that help with that kind of stuff, um, and I would think. Um, <coughs> So we could we could send them to like Colorado Enterprise Fund who helps small businesses get started and helps with that kind of thing. So I think there's resources 
as well for that. Um, so it's, yeah, if we move here. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, it sounds like it's less of a, like it's a cost thing for them and it's more just like, we just don't have enough general contractors that can do all the work. Uh, yeah, more have somebody experienced and ready to go. Um, maybe because this will be televised, people will, I right. should have it. <laughs> We you should have contact who wanted. Right. I was going to say. I mean, that, that seems to be the problem, <laughs> is advertising What's to get that? contractors. Yeah, that yeah. seems to be the issue. <laughs> it's just getting, an, you know, the advertising out there. Yeah. We could, you could help contractors with that, but the word needs to get out, so. Because yeah. there seems like a lot of people out there that would so, kind of so do Grandma's that. So, Grandma's kind of interested. This is kind of in your wheelhouse, yeah, right? Yeah, a little bit. And you have... Do you have any thoughts on how we could <coughs> I mean, recruit I mean, as, excited as a, contractors for this yeah. project? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, as, as a contractor, um, it just seems like high cost, low reward. You know what I mean? That you you have to do double bids, and it is competitive against some mandated price range within fifteen percent. So the profit margin is probably pretty low, I would imagine. But I imagine the government stipulates the you know, the profitability of the job, I and mean, they're fairly low dollar value. They're averaging $8,000, so it's really more in the realm of a handyman in terms of its value, um, and so contractors, it's hard to be attracted to it, so I mean, I think it would have to be, from my perspective, almost a, you know, a, a, a social benefit project for you know, an established large contractor in the community to take on these kinds of projects. It would be sort of a, I, I think the appeal would be the marketing value. That look, mm -hmm. this company is a contractor, we care about our community, and so we're engaged with the city of Longmont and helping these rehab programs, and that would be, I think, the hook to make it worth a contractor to, to engage these kind of projects and deal with the government red tape and the lower value projects is that they, they would get their name on the community. Mm -hmm. so that, that would be the pitch. I think that would be the pitch. I can see a lot of the, like, I can see it even like the higher value homeowners that are co looking at contractors seeing that type of thing and that being, because so many people are looking at like, are the people I'm doing business with, um, you know, are they socially responsible? Like there's a lot of people that are interested in, so I can see that being, you know, for like the people who are doing the hundred, two hundred thousand dollar jobs, if they know that the contractor they're working with is also doing those things, it might be appealing to at least some homeowners that are doing those. Yep. Just, just as a thought, our, because so many of these, uh, all of what we've discussed are remodels, um, it seems like new construction versus remodels, remodels can fit in um, time, seasonality, when new construction but you know, as I remember, you want to have your, your basic framework up in your roof and your walls before bad weather hits so you can do all your inside work. But is there no timing advantage to some of these remodels for a contractor keeping their staff their their um, staff busy? You know what I mean? Yeah, there would be a benefit to have some nice interior jobs that weren't schedule, sen schedule sensitive, that if you have weather delays or something like that, you would have small projects to pick up to and build a gap. Um, so that, that is, that would be a benefit. And yeah, if you don't make a ton of money, it's hard to get people to want to do it. Yeah, it's hard enough looking for contractors. Let so. alone well, um, city. Okay, so then going into the affordable housing program, and this is really just looking at the affordable housing fund. Um, <coughs> So we um, made a $300,000 loan to purchase Longmont Mobile Home Park, if you remember, so they could become a resident-owned community, and that has moved forward and is completed. Um, a $600,000 loan was provided to Thistle to refinance and rehab their Longmont properties, um, and that has, they have started work on, I think, all of their properties um, <coughs> on that, and they have actually repaid $300,000 of the 600000 already. Um, a $110,000 loan was made to Habitat to do um, pre-development work at the Rogers Road site, so they have submitted plans um, for um, into planning and development services um, for 
um, construction um, review um, going forward on that. Um, I think, maybe it was just a pre-app. I can't remember if they actually submitted yet or if it was a pre-app, but they have been moving forward anyway. I know that. Um, we made a $287,300 loan to the in-between to finish construction on the MICA homes, and almost all of that has been spent, and the homes are CO'd, I think, and started leasing, if not fully leased. Um, we um, continued work on two of the pilot projects, um, the ADU stock plans and the planning facilitator. So the planning facilitator, and I think I talked a little about it later, but um, <clears throat> has been very successful actually. And this, if you remember, is a, a contract that we did um, to see if we could help smaller um, developers um, get through the planning and development review process, which is quite lengthy um, when they're less sophisticated and don't know as much about how the whole process works. And um, we have assisted six different developers in 2019, um, two of those have moved to building permits, um, and another one, another two, no, three are still moving through the process, and then one hasn't moved forward yet, so um, they're still available. So um, we have felt this is pretty successful. We are not out of funds yet, but maybe mid-year we might be coming back to have some additional funds go into that contract. Um, on the ADU stock plans, <coughs> we have the, the plans fully completed. There's four different um, varieties. Um, I should have added those in here. Um, <coughs> Um, and they're through building permit. They've been approved through building permits, so we've got that. So everything is now waiting on me to finish <laughs> the financial analysis. Um, so what they cost to build versus what the rents are at an affordable level, how much are we going to have to subsidize to make it attractive for a period of time, and, um, and then put the collateral information, the um, brochures and that kind of stuff together with, what does the website look like, et cetera, and then launch, launch the program, which <clears throat> we should get going here in, in April, assuming we don't get shut down for coronavirus. Um, so, so that is moving forward, um, and we will get that, that program going. Um, that will have to go back to council for approval because we are looking at um, fee waivers um, to apply to those, which that doesn't have to go to council, but. Um, I think an additional subsidy, what I'm looking at is somewhere between probably twenty to 35000 per um, ADU <coughs> in order to bridge the gap um, for loans they would have to take out um, and the rents that they could charge on that and still cover their taxes, their insurance, their um, replacement reserves and all that kind of stuff. So kind of laying all that out um, and that would be um, what I would suggest is that it probably would be a forgivable loan um, if we, um, if their interest, whoever is interested in doing this, sign an agreement to keep the uh, rents affordable for 10 years, um, the uh, loan would be forgiven over that 10 year period as long as they kept it affordable, so. Um, for those stock plans, do you know right now what the range of like building costs for those are that you're estimating? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the low end is 60,000 for like a studio, standalone studio, and these are all standalone units, um, up to I think it's 175 um, that has a, I think it has a two bedroom, I think it's a bedroom and a loft or a bedroom and a nook. Um, but that's with a garage construction. Um, I think what I'm finding is I'm going to have to take the garage out. They can obviously build it over a garage if they want, but they're going to have to finance that themselves, and we're not going to subsidize that, so I'll have to take that. That's another thing I'm struggling with, is figuring out that whole calculation. So, <coughs> But yeah, there's two of them that can be built over garages, or they can be built by themselves, and then the other two are just standalone. Mm. So they're kind of cute little units really cool I think that that seems like a really interesting thing yeah we, <coughs> we sold a house last year and that's it like the people coming in were like 
we're going to build an ADU. Um, but to have it sort of like packaged to be able to provide affordable, mm -hmm. um, I think would make it a lot easier for a lot of people to, to think about that. <coughs> I, I do want to say I was at a presentation yesterday morning at the downtown Boulder Partnership, uh, their board meeting, and the home, one of the representatives from home wanted presented. And she specifically presented uh, Micah Holmes and the stock plans. Mm -hmm saying that these things are happening in Longmont and Boulder really needs to catch up uh, to the, the work that's being done here. So I think that's um, very complimentary to the work you're doing, but it's really nothing else. If we get it going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're close. It's like... <laughs> so close. Hey, do you so want close. it? <laughs> We're just going to have a whole bunch of signs yeah, people signs. can stick in their yards and <laughs> contractor, ADU. Yeah. <laughs> the TV. Um, and then the city-owned properties um, program that we just got started, um, if you remember, the city um, reviewed its um, <clears throat> properties that it has purchased basically through open space and through water sewer <clears throat> purchases. Um, and we are slowly converting those to affordable rentals. Um, so we did set aside 125,000 to rehab one of the properties um, and we're waiting, it's um, a cr right involved in the um, Greenway improvements on County Line 1 just north of 9th Avenue. Um, so there's a lot of construction going on and they're using most of the property for um, staging area. So there's no point in adding to the chaos by having rehab contractors in there. So we're gonna wait until they're done um, with that one. The, uh, one of the other properties we did um, um, lease to Habitat to have some of their um, volunteers at um, and temporary staff um, stay out, which helps save them some costs um, and increases their capacity to um, uh, get and utilize volunteers mm -hmm. as they prepare for upcoming inclusionary housing builds so that's exciting um, <clears throat> and then we provided uh, a little over one hundred fifty seven thousand eight hundred dollars in fee waivers from the affordable housing fund um, which supported 66 rental homes which was the Micah home project and the Fall River um, senior rental project so that's an average of 20 uh, just under twenty four hundred dollars per um, rental home with fee waivers that were provided. <clears throat> so um, administration-wise, um, we conducted three application cycles in 2019. 11 applications were received and reviewed. Five projects were approved for affordable housing funding, as well as five for CDBG and one home. <coughs> we um, instituted the inclusionary housing program, and we moved only six units closer <laughs> to our goal in 2019 um, because Micah Homes and Fall River didn't get CO'd until 2020. We were hoping they were going to get CO's in, in 2019. Um, so we added um, four units at Blue Vista and um, two Habitat for sale homes um, was all we added in 2019. And then on the Regional um, Affordable Housing Partnership, which you were um, talking about. Um, I personally was involved in six different community presentations about that. Um, we've got a ballot measure, countywide ballot measure that's being explored. Um, we set up um, an affordable housing trust fund governance structure and distribution formula is ready to go if that ballot measure moves forward. So again, it would operate kind of like the home a little bit like the home with um, Boulder County, all Boulder County communities um, participating and receiving funding um, as well as allowing for funding for um, a countywide down payment assistance program and a countywide rehab program. So that might get to some of the, the mass that we need to get the rehab program expanded by operating it countywide. Um, and then it would also allow for some um, competitive funds as well. And then the Home Wanted um, Education and Support Campaign um, started and really kicked off and kicked into gear in 2019. So we'll keep you posted on what's going on as we move into 2020. 
Is the ballot measure a tax increase, a sales tax? Or um, we're not sure at this point. They're going to do some polling in um, <coughs> end of March, first part of April. Um, county commissioners will make the decision. I think they're, well, I'm not sure if they're going to pull both on property and sales. Um, it is looking like it might be a um, housing and transportation tax together um, that would move forward. <coughs> um, so we're, we've started meeting and we've only had three, I think, meetings to, all together so far. So um, keep it posted on. And I presume it would be potentially delayed if it was determined <coughs> that this is not a good year to ask for a tax increase because of the pending recession. And yeah, I'm sure that will fit, fit into it. I mean, we were pretty well that if we were going to do it, we should do it in 2020 because of the anticipated high turnout yeah. <coughs> for the uh, presidential election and um, younger voters in uh, particular being engaged. Um, but yeah, if we go into recession, then that might be a whole different story. <laughs> Okay, Would, that's that, all I've got, but you got... That's the end of that. That's Listen, the end of that you. one. Yeah. Well, we asked a lot of questions during the presentation. All of those were excellent. Uh, are there any additional questions for Kathy on this 2019 performance report? I do have one question. Does HUD evaluate these reports and say, that's good, you know, we should continue to do what we're doing, or that's bad, they should get any more money, or? Yeah, uh, so they, they do evaluate them. <coughs> um, they look um, and compare the goals that you set as part of the consolidated plan, which we're getting ready to start another five-year consolidated plan. We set five-year goals, and then we set annual goals, excuse me, as well. So they compare back to the goals. Um, <coughs> they um, they do send a report that they have looked at everything and whether you are considered to be adequate or inadequate. They don't use the word good. No, they no. <laughs> no. Adequate is as good adequate as it gets. Is Satisfactory, maybe that's that's high. It's oh, high. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's an interesting. They're very subdued. <laughs> 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 kind of like an audit Pretty the highest you can give is that there are no findings. <laughs> <laughs> Along those lines, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they really look at how are you doing with, are you meeting, um, are you exceeding any of the caps that you can't exceed? Are you primarily serving low moderate income folks? Um, you know, somewhat how you're doing with your goals, but if you have narrative that explains why you didn't meet something or why you over exceeded on something, <coughs> I, they just don't give you much feedback on that kind of stuff. So it's really the, the primary triggers that they look at. So it seems I mean, there's a lot accomplished, right? Timing affects what period they go into. It sounds like 2020 may be a really upper year for getting a bunch of projects completed on the books, but uh, it seems good, right? That, so some of the things I know you're concerned about with like being at 1.43 of uh, 1.5, but you're still under, probably no reason for concern. Uh, you will be likely found adequate, I'm guessing. Yes. You'll be weighed <laughs> and found adequate. Okay. Yes, mostly satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> Almost we should keep a list of the adjectives. <laughs> there would be five of them, I think. All right, excellent. Yes. Does does HUD flag the fact that we had so many unexpent, like unused funds? Is that a concern for you know future grants or anything like that? Um, so that's why they they look at the one point five. If they grow um, over that, that's yeah. the trigger. Yeah. That, that's the biggest trigger, so I mean, if you go over that, then they start, um, well, you have to have a plan of how you're going to get out of it the next year, but then if you're over it again, then they start docking your, your funding, theoretically. I'm sure a Chicago or a New York City would probably never reach their 1.5. <laughs> I have not heard they've ever had funding taken away 
of it, it may be, they do, I don't know. It's just, yeah. I'm curious about um, the funding that's supposed to be applied in January, and we don't get till September. Uh, and it's happened for years, right? 15? And a trend. A trend for mm -hmm. years. Is there anything that can um, you can do or can be done to break that trend and get it back on track? Well, so it's all tied to Congress yeah. and their inability yeah, the to approve a budget so on time. The <laughs> so the answer is <laughs> yeah, no to that no. one. <laughs> so I have advocated that they can change the 1.5 or they can choose to ignore it. I mean, there are regulatory things that HUD could do and their response was, why don't you change your program year to start later in the year? I, I was going to ask if, if there was something we needed to. <laughs> or July or whatever. Yeah, the problem July is you lose funds. We lose funds yeah. for a period of time if we did that. Because you can't move back, you'd have to move forward. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so you'd have a gap. So they wouldn't retro anything, huh? No. I'm just kidding. Not yet. Try. Try. I mean, if it continues to be a trend, does it make sense at some point to bump it by like mm. a month each year, <coughs> so you don't really lose? So you like the amount of funds you could potentially lose is really low, and then you eventually catch up to where they actually are allocating the funds, so that we well, don't. Well, if we were ever going to do that, what I would do is move it all the way back to <coughs> the um, so we were a whole year behind. So almost take a hiatus for a year. Mm. So you're a whole year behind the fiscal year. The community I came from in Ohio, we were a year behind the federal fiscal year. So we got our funds always on time. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, they've had a, almost a year to work it out. Now, at some point, they might start getting even further behind. But um, yeah, it's hardly worth it to me to what you would lose to move it to like July or even to September without going all the way back behind mm -hmm. the, the federal fiscal year. So have you have you lost money before? No. Oh. So it's it's working. So it's an inconvenience, but it's something you're able to work with at this yeah. point. Mm -hmm. The problem is that when you consistently get your money so late, you you just can't spend. You know, you're just behind all right. the time, and it's very right. difficult mm -hmm. to to catch up. So yeah. this year. We've, we've got our allocation amount. We have not got our letter from HUD about when they're going to do our grant agreement. We're hoping it'll be May to June this year. So if we can start getting it a little bit earlier and a little bit earlier, then that would help us. But and there's nothing like a federal line of credit that will, you can draw on until the grant agreement is in place, given the, the you know, the grant agreement is relatively secure, right? The getting one is not a high risk. Well, what you can do is you can ask for a waiver to um, enter into agreements before you get your grant agreement. Okay. It's a process. Okay. And, you know, there's no guarantee. They always tell you there's no guarantee you're going to get your grant agreement. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're so putting you're your, funds, your local funds at risk. And we do that for our admin and for um, the rehab program so they continue and we don't have to yeah. stop them, but um, to actually give funds to another organization and take that risk is, we have not done that. Okay. All right, let's move on to the 2020. So the 2020, I don't have any big presentation. It's really more, if you have questions, it's just really showing you this is where we ended up um, when council approved it. Um, the slight change that happened was that we actually found out our grant amount um, as we were, uh, at, right after, actually, right after we had submitted our council con to council, so I had to do an amended one. Um, so the chart has the circle around it. Um, the colorful chart looks like this. <coughs> so the numbers highlighted in orangish 
or what changed um, from when you guys saw it to what actually went to council and was approved. Um, again, because we had anticipated getting a similar grant amount to 2019, which was 622,000, and we got 610. Um, so we uh, lowered the um, security deposit amount by about 2,000, I think, um, for 2020. And we had told in between they could get up to 160,000. Um, and so we lowered that by 64,000. And then the administration amount lowered a little bit as well. Any reason for the decrease in the grant? It was just, it's what, it's just what happened. It's yeah. a formula that they plug in the numbers. My guess is because I think that alloc the, oblig the approved amount actually increased, but every year there's more entitlements. Um, of the communities ebb and flow on their poverty rates yeah. and construction gotcha. and housing stock. The better you're doing, the less you get, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with our housing prices that are increasing, hmm. I'm not that uh, But it wasn't a huge. No, but we did get a decrease 2019 from 2018, so it's so steadily going down. Yes. Which I think okay. might have been. I put that in this presentation that you got a copy of. I can't remember. I did somewhere. I showed. And so the memo that you included, Kathy, this, I guess it was the memo to council. Mm -hmm. Copy of that. <coughs> so that's all that was. Perfect. Any questions on the 2020 uh, action plan specifically or anything related to the changes? Uh, so we've gone through this before. Uh, was it last year? Uh, no, but did we go through recommendations that were, staff was making on this? I think we finalized them um, early this year. Okay. Yes. So I'm trying to think if our new members were here when we did that. I think it was my in the very first meeting in January. Yeah, so you probably remember more about it than we do. <laughs> uh, nothing unusual here, though. This is all pretty standard. So if you, I, I would suggest because if you haven't had a chance to read the memo, go through the memo to council. I'm sure you probably already read it. Uh, but if you do have questions, it might be, if you don't have any now, reach out to Kathy with any questions that you might have some follow-up, because uh, I know it's a lot of information and without the context, it would be difficult to put that into a questionable format. All right, thank you, Kathy. Let's see. It's the Kathy hair. Show. <laughs> now it's the Inclusionary Housing <laughs> Mentors. Yes, so now we are on to item seven, reviewing the 2019 Inclusionary Housing Program metrics. information in here so I thought I would go through it. Um, this was the presentation that was made to council um, and did everyone or does everyone have this? I don't know if you printed it out and were able to or whatever. Um, yeah. Okay. I've got extra copies. <coughs> yeah, it's, in the, it's, a, it's at the end of the city council communication. It's like so this is an update on the inclusionary housing program <coughs> which just started in 2019 it was approved at the very end of 2018 <coughs> 
<coughs> um, so the um, most of the developments that are under construction right now were approved before the ordinance went into effect, so we are just now starting to see some developments come under this program. So there are about 20 different projects that are going to fall under the ordinance as of this point in time, which changes. If this was through the end of 2019. Nine of those were providing, um, have chosen to provide their affordable housing on site. Five of the developments are um, already chosen to make the fee in lieu payment, and then eight of the developments are still undecided, so they're moving through the process. Um, this adds up more th up to more than 20 because some are doing both payment in lieu and providing units. So one in particular is doing some of the units, um, the whole number of units on site, and then paying the fraction payment in lieu. Does that nine number surprise you? I think that would be flipped. Uh, just in terms of, and I, how I've thought about this, I, I've always believed that developers would be more inclined to pay in lieu and offer housing on the site. So this, is, I, I, what I'm saying is, this is a good number for you. I'm wondering if it comes to surprise for you at all. Um, or if there's any. Yeah. So most of them that are providing on site are rentals. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a little easier to do it. It's cheaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cheaper. Yeah. Okay. How, hard, how hard would it be to add to the ordinance to, re to provide an option that they perform CDVG house rehab? <laughs> it's not a terrible idea. More votes. <laughs> More votes. That's all awesome. right. There's no what, financial reason not to. Uh, it's an APM little war you can fix. 12 of our CDBG projects. Yeah, the problem with that is that we can't, um, it doesn't seem fair to deed restrict permanently affordable a house that somebody already owns. Um, and we are trying with the increase of housing to get permanently affordable and to increase the number of units. I'm sorry? Yeah, and to increase the number of units. Right. right and to get yeah, yeah. new units. But your thought wasn't to deed restrict those houses that they're rehabbing. It's just to, to incentivize them to help with some other piece of our affordable, like our housing issues, right? Like it was basically to say, like rather th rather than paying a fee, you agree to at least bid on some of these things. Right. That, or that like is what I was saying, but I think in order to get it to count toward our, our initiative of affordable housing, it would have to be rent controlled and less Got it. De de restricted. I think this is, yeah. Two different programs there. Yeah. <laughs> you, you keep thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on it. Yeah. Um, all right. So the um, projects that are providing the homes on site, um, Actually, the numbers are equal for rental and five, I'm sorry, five rental and five for sale, so I misspoke. Um, but the um, homes in the projects that um, rental developments total homes are 789, and 230 of those 789 would be affordable. <coughs> and the majority um, are provided within market rate development. So they're not 100% affordable, but they are within market rate development. I, I see where you made the mistake. There was the rate of affordable homes that are those rental units is significantly higher than the rate of those. Yeah. Uh, for sale exactly. Yep. I see what you mean. Um, and the uh, for sale um, developments uh, total 100, uh, 1,422 total units. Um, 52 of the um, of homes are affordable. And the majority of the affordable for sale homes are being provided in partnership with the nonprofits. So the developer isn't the one that's actually providing the units. They're donating land, basically. Um, so the fee in lieu that we're estimating um, for uh, three of the rental projects, um, our um, estimate is 48,400 that we would get in um, payments. And on the for sale projects that have chosen fee and lieu, um, we're estimating about 1.4 million from those. So um, significantly more because the homes are larger and it's based on a 
a higher fee in lieu per square foot rate and um, the square footage is higher. So we're still trying to figure out when these are going to come in, but um, the pipeline on the right hand side, um, we think we might get around 330,000 in 2020 um, and then about 500,000 each in um, 2021 and 2022. Obviously this will change. <coughs> We know more and um, projects develop and change, etc. And it could all go to yeah. craziness if we go into recession. Yeah, that's supposed to Um So the interest in building the middle tier housing, um, if you remember, our program is um, somewhat unique in that you can, um, if the development is willing to build in the 80 to 120% AMI, 81 to 120% AMI range, um, they get different levels of exemption from the 12% requirement um, to incentivize um, that middle tier range. Um, we've got several that are in the review process and have said that they're interested, but we don't have any signed agreements yet committing to building the middle tier. Um, so. We don't really count them, but council wanted to know this information. So one of the projects in South Hover, which is um, south of um, Oscar Blues, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's a triangle property right oh, just south, south, south of there. Mm -hmm. They are anticipating um, building the majority of theirs in the 101 to 110 percent AMI range, and then some in the, the next range up. Um, so there still would be some, if they hit these targets, there still would be some fee and lieu that would be due. 40% of the fee and lieu for the 101 to 110, and 80% of the fee and lieu for the 111 to 120%. Um, <clears throat> and then Mountain Brook, even though they satisfied some of their units with the Habitat land donation and the Veterans Community Project land donation, um, have got about 49 unsatisfied units. And so somebody's going to have to make a fee in lieu or meet the middle tier, um, whether it's in the town or the condo part of their development. So we're working through that, what that's going to look like. So that triangle, they're planning to have 236 single family or freestanding homes on that property? Yes, I can't remember if they're town home development or if it's a mix. I can't. It's a lot. Might be condos. I'm not sure. I don't get traffic at all. I'm trying not. To, I'm trying to extricate myself. <laughs> from a, a person. So just taking a look at the market um, and what is happening with that. Um, so median sales prices are kind of leveling out um, at the end of 2019. Um, within both the attached for sale and the detached for sale prices. Um, there was a 1.3% increase <coughs> in the sales prices of de uh, median sales price for detached homes and a 0.74%, so a bit less than 1% decrease <coughs> in the attached um, prices. Um, some leveling may be due to more homes being available to purchase. There was a 5% increase in the number of units that were available 2018 to 2019 in um, the detached home product and an 11% increase in the attached home product. So um, mm -hmm. a lot more townhomes and condos were actually available in um, 2019 than there were available in 2018, which could account for some of that. <coughs> um, on new homes versus existing home sales, um, new homes are becoming a greater part of home sales, increasing from a low of 4% in 2010 um, to a high of 28.7% in 2018, and we ended 2019 at 22% of all home sales were new home sales versus existing home sales. Um, so a change, you can, you can just see that the recession and beyond, we, there was no new home construction, obviously, and it has increased over time. <clears throat> so this chart shows the income needed to purchase or rent in Longmont compared to um, our median income and our uh, affordable rates. So um, the blue line on the top is the income that's needed to purchase uh, at the median home sales price 
single family detached home sales price. And the reddish line, uh, solid reddish line is the um, income that's needed to purchase the median attached home sales price over the years. Um, the green line, the, um, oh, you're all <coughs> to the green line. The purple line is the income needed to purchase, um, or I'm sorry, the income needed to rent in Longmont over year, the years, the median rent. The green line is the, um, green solid line is the median income for the city of Longmont over the years, and we don't have 2019 yet because it's um, American Community Survey data and it hasn't come out yet, or at least when I put this chart together. <coughs> and then the red dashed line is the 80% HUD median income for a three-person family, um, which is usually what we use to set the sales prices for um, detached home prices. So you can see there's a big, big, big gap there. Um, and then the dashed purple line is 50% of the HUD median income um, for a two-person, which is usually what we use to, um, it's kind of that cut for rent. Um, they're not likely to be able to purchase so those HUD <laughs> ones are, are based on nationwide medians? Silver County. Oh, okay. But the city median, is high it doesn't track, like they're not even, right, like over time. So like the red dotted one is above the green in 2010. Right. Okay. Is that because Boulder, or Longmont city median income was lower than Boulder County as a whole? Yes, likely. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, just trying to yeah. orient myself on the. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, sometimes you have to really think about that. So, because green is city of Longmont, right. and whereas those yeah, those so orange and purple are really based. Our incomes as a city have increased somewhat, um, but folks in the low and moderate income have not. Got it. <coughs> and still, people in the green line can't afford to purchase attached or <laughs> mm -hmm. at the median can't afford to purchase attached or detached. Yeah. And is that calculation what you look at income you get to afford average rents, is that based on like the rule of thirty percent of your income should go no more than that? So so Karen, does this help you with the questions that yeah. you had about AMI? Yeah. And is that the same for like the income needed to afford the sales prices is also based on that 30% yes. um, that your essentially your mortgage would be 33%, no more than 33% of your income, okay. It's a really big gap, right? You're looking at 95,000 for a single family. Yeah. And the average is 60. But also like if you're making, I mean, that 33, if you're spending 33% of your income, you're at sort of the max. And that's that's assuming everything is going well for yes. somebody making that to be able to afford a house at that. <laughs> um. well, and we know, we know from other things that we've seen is there's so many folks that are rent burdened that are above 50% of their income. Right. Not just rent, but housing costs yeah. rent. And so they could own a home and their income hasn't kept up with their taxes have increased and everything else. So, so <laughs> something like the um, home away uh, promotion. Home wanted. Home wanted. I was going to say home away, Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> Home one. Thank you. So, however that tax works, I, I mean, there has to be this question because ideally, there's some redistribution of money to say, you know, most people are not able to afford a home here, but some are able to afford a lot of them. Uh, but depending on how the tax works, it's potentially people who can't afford a home that are paying a tax to maybe help them afford a home. I guess it's progressive in some ways. It's a sales tax or something. 
I'm just it, because it seems to me to be exactly the right idea have the community as a whole contribute to this issue and figure out how to fund it. Uh, there's, it's just this strikes me that there are a lot of people here who can't, who need the benefit, and there's only a few who can afford to pay into that. So, not a question, just me trying to work through that. Yep. And these gaps are getting bigger, is, mm -hmm. is what I'm seeing. Is yeah. it just bigger and bigger over, over the years? And it doesn't seem like it's, I mean, even if the prices level off, it seems like that, that gap is, is big enough that it's going to continue to be an issue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right now, it's the median household income is short by a third of what's needed in order to afford us. That's a big chunk to make. Uplifting guys. <laughs> 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 Should have led we're with this one and made it. <laughs> <laughs> So um, in looking at rental need versus um, what we're providing or what we're getting in the inclusionary housing program, um, so this shows information from the draft consolidated plan, which you'll get next month in, in greater detail. It shows that the greatest rental housing need is um, for folks that are at or below 40% of the area median income, which is those um, top five um, both, uh, categories there. Um, and our inclusionary housing rental projects, the ones that have been approved um, to provide the units on site, and I just saw that they have green all over Spell check. Um, Spell right. I was going to say, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an actual right word. <laughs> <laughs> um, are providing primarily 60% area median income. Um, where there is not a gap or a need. Um, so I don't know if you can see this, if you can see it on your better on your um, projection thing, but there's uh, 2,373 unit need in that 40% area median income of below the number of units that we need. Um, and we have provided through inclusion, just through the inclusionary housing program, 14 of the units will be at 30% and five will be at 40%, so 19 total, um, 56 at 50%, and then the majority, 155 <coughs> at 60% AMI. So um, I think we do need to look at <coughs> whether or not we should go back down to having the um, affordability limit for rental housing at 50% AMI um, to be under the inclusionary housing program. So. And we were at 50, we went up to 60 when they passed the inclusionary housing. Um, and, and a lot of people came in with 60 mm -hmm. percent. Why 50 if the need is 40? Um, well, because it's very difficult to provide 40. Um, 50 at least gets us closer, and it might, by pushing it down to 50. So, so the whole theory is that <coughs> if you build higher end rental units, People who are in lower priced housing that doesn't have anything at the higher end will move up and out and it'll free up we'll units, free up the right? Rent. Which has not been happening. Um, so, so it's kind of the trickle up yeah. versus yeah. trickle down, or it's trickle down in a different way kind of thing. So, <clears throat> the theory was that there was kind of demand for rental housing, which there was. Um, right after the recession, um, and you can see there is a gap for really, really, really high end rental housing. Um, there's 1,455 unit gap there, yeah. <clears throat> but that's also not where folks are building. Um, so the thought was if you build enough in that middle range, mm -hmm. 70 to whatever it goes up to. Um, that folks who are currently in the the lower that 427 area, yeah, like here. Yeah. <clears throat> so folks who are currently in there and can afford to be here will move here. 
so there's see there's only a 39 unit um, surplus in the 50 that's about 50 percent yeah AMI so if we keep it at 50 and actually get some units there then that might start to happen a little bit mm -hmm. but isn't building that here isn't going to happen <laughs> going to help enough people move I mean isn't that mm -hmm. movement predicated on people's circumstances improving like so it, it's based on the assumption that people in the 25 to 35 to roughly 35 range can afford to move up when the reality is if you're paying you know, whatever you're paying for rental housing, I just got a new apartment for you, 50 months, I got really lucky. Um, but if you're paying whatever you're paying, right, for, for really, really hesitant, especially if you're on the, in that income yeah. range, yeah. to move up into anything. Um, especially, right. if you're, yeah, especially if you're in a position with your company. You have it's to be very optimistic about your future in order to sell to well, your future income, yep. right? No, your it, future. Yeah. You could also, it could also be that you're in this like <coughs> 35 to 50 range, but you're in one of those affordable, <coughs> like ones that are, you know, $500 a month, which means that you're sort of taking the stock for the folks that are in that. And if you actually moved into one that was, quote, in your income range, that would open up things so that we would have at least some of the folks that are actually <coughs> in that income range be able to live there. Um, when I was talking to the folks at the in-between this week, they said that that's one of the biggest things that they're looking at is what are the barriers to people actually leaving the transitional housing? And is it, can they afford what's next? Like, can they, do they have all the things they need to do that? Because if they don't, they can't move out, which means somebody else can't move in. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, that's why people at the in-between stay at the in-between for a long time. Yeah, but if you have some security, mm -hmm. you're likely to hang on to it. Yeah. yeah. And if, and if there's only 39 extra units, if you're in that 25 to 35 range and there's only a surplus of 39, like you might not have one that's close enough to where you work or close enough to a bus line or whatever it is that you need to actually make that work. Even if your income grows, if you're comfortable where you are, you're just going to pocket that extra mm -hmm. cash. You're not going to, you know, you're not necessarily going to automatically move into the next round. Yeah. yeah. I mean, or spend more. I mean, right. Yeah. yeah. Whatever it is. <laughs> so, um, 2019 sales, there was 1,440 total home sales in 2019. Um, <clears throat> we um, pulled this information from the Boulder County Assessor website, so there's still some scrubbing that needs to do. Um, so, most of the homes, again, were um, existing homes <coughs> versus new homes. Um, and then if you break out the existing homes and new homes by the income categories, um, you can see where <laughs> things are being built and where things are not being built. This is just kind of illustrating that. <coughs> so next to no homes in the below 80% area median income area, um, you know, Again, 62 out of 500 and compared to 544 in that 81 to 100 percent, 65 in the t compared to 278 and 101 to 120, and then over 120, 183 new homes um, compared to 202 um, existing home sales. <coughs> um, of the seven new sales below 80 percent, four were those Blue Vista homes that I told you about, so under our program. And then three are townhomes in non-inclusionary housing development. So a little bit of market help, but um, not a whole lot. So the, mm -hmm. the lower income tiers are really relying on these existing homes yes. um, for these purchases. Yeah, and Councilmember Rodriguez said that the um, in this range in particular, they're still seeing a lot of competition for the home. So when I was talking about that the home sales prices have flattened somewhat in 2019, he pointed out that in this category, 81 to 100 percent, they are seeing multiple bids, multiple offers still. Um, so there's still quite a, a 
appetite and a and competition in that area. So, um, so okay. council is is spot on that they're trying to increase, you know, housing under the existing housing in there. Okay. Do you know if if council and you just talked about in that range is it primarily actual? Um, potential homeowners or, or speculators? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was happening for a while, whether it still is or not. That I, I, just be, I just be interested to see it, yeah. Yeah, I know when I was in scrubbing some of the data, you could tell that's what was happening, that especially in the 80% mm -hmm. and below. I took out several that were. Yeah, because um, they're, they're going to jump up to, they're going to, those, that sold in 2019 may sell, may sell again, but they're going to be at these other the once they've been go. remodeled and invested in and you know flipped basically. Yeah. So the I, I would guess that that category represents <coughs> gentrification as well, right? The idea that these these low what was once a lower income neighborhood all of a sudden becomes interesting. It's you know the architecture is mixed, the homes need some work, but people are moving into them who are hipster, right? I and mean, they're into it. It's, like, <laughs> it's not just you hipsters. You've watched a lot of HTTP. <laughs> 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 I don't know, do we have gentrifying areas in Longmont? <laughs> well, I think, yeah. I think gentrification can happen across the income levels as much as it can happen in ethnic uh, ways as well. Um, so I'm thinking about East, towards Martin mm -hmm. is becoming increasingly more desirable for young couples, young families. Uh, and that seems to be where it's like, okay, we'll take a loan and we'll fix up the house and then <coughs> it's no longer <coughs> what it once was. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to say, I know of at least three flips that were at the end of the year last year, oh, right along Martin on yeah. some of those side streets that was exactly, you know, they were bought at like 250 and then sold for like 420 um, like pretty significant. Um. That's what I'm wondering if that if we're going to see just the jump from uh, 81 and 100 to 101 to 120 on the same on the same properties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, do you have a? Can you do you know offhand roughly what those sales prices are for those um, each of those categories? Like, do you know where that falls? Mm -hmm. If you don't, that's okay. I um. don't know the top of my. I didn't bring that in. Well, no, I do. 81 to 100 percent tier is 300 to 430. Wow. Wow, that's. So we looked at below 80 percent is below 300,000. 81 to 100 was 301 to 430. 101 to 120 was 430. In one dollar mm -hmm. <laughs> to five hundred and twenty thousand, and then five hundred over hundred five hundred twenty was. Thank you. <coughs> that is uh, at eighty to one hundred. I'm surprised how high those prices are. Yes, we yes we're going to be looking at those because I'm wondering if I don't think. So by type of home, the majority of the home sales are single family, um, which in this case does include townhomes um, because of the way the assessor's data, we didn't have time to go out and scrub those out. So um, the top line on each of the categories is all homes, um, the middle line is single family, and then the bottom line is condos <coughs> um, by the different ranges. And then this is um, just breaking down the single family sales by prices available at the different AMIs. Um, so I think it's just the same, it's a little bit different way of showing it. <coughs> yeah, there's the prices. 
Yeah, there's the prices on that. Yeah. Yeah. See that there? I saw that somewhere. Um, so single family new homes are uh, trending to higher priced units, unlike the existing market, which still shows the majority of homes in the 81 to 100% AMI tier. Um, also, um, single family category includes townhomes, which also may be skewing a higher number in this category. So, you flipped it. You're all the way to the end of what you did. Hmm? Nope. Gosh, what do you do? Just go ahead with the We've got the page. Yeah. 15. I thought it was going to be easy. New sales are in the, the lighter blue, so um, new homes are for single family or in the higher income range, obviously. <coughs> so for condos, the breakout by AMI um, shows this. Um, 30 <coughs> homes, 18%, were in the 120%. 8% of the homes were in the 80%, uh, below 80% AMI, and the majority of condo sales were in the um, 101 to 120% AMI. And this is market again, it's not housing yet. And then again, um, so the new home, new condo sales, there were none below 80%. Um, which see, would seem to suggest that the new condos being built are mimicking the existing housing market. Um, and by a slight majority, most of them are in the 100, uh, 100 to 120, 100 and above. So. All right, and this one we've already seen and discussed. We need to create 200 new homes annually. <coughs> the pipeline of what we're um, projecting <coughs> for the affordable inclusionary homes, um, estimated upcoming new units, um, an additional 352 homes for a 6.5% goal attainment by 20 2023 if everything um, pans out as they are. Um, none of these are getting us to 200 in a year, so obviously we have to still look at our, using our affordable housing funds to support uh, other projects the fee in lieu when that starts coming in, um, and also purchasing existing and converting to affordable. <coughs> so some of the metrics that we're using to measure um, inclusionary housing and what we'll be tracking, um, changes in building permits, um, how did those compare to the state and our surrounding <coughs> communities, changes in the median home sales prices as we started to show here, and how that might impact our inclusionary housing goal, um, AMI targets, um, and what the market's providing. Um, how the units are being provided, is the fee and lose sufficient to replace units? How are we doing against our 12% goal attainment? And then eventually, who's being served with the program as we start to actually get units and people start moving into them. <coughs> so some of the trends that we're seeing, um, in a uh, number of projects, for sale and rental are choosing um, right now to provide units. Um, no, I'm sorry. Both for sale and rental are choosing the same proportion of fee and lieu to units, so um, that is not favoring one over the other yet. Rental affordable housing units are primarily pro being provided within the development, um, and the greatest area of rental units needed below 50% are below, are not what is being provided, um, which we talked about. So moving forward, um, some of the things we're going to be looking at, um, <coughs> the code was somewhat unclear and it applied very broadly. We've had situations come up where um, 
people are renovating their existing house um, and they might be adding um, new um, uh, I say units, but more bedrooms or um, they might be adding um, to their existing dwelling. Um, so what do we do with that? Um, other residential dwellings, we've had some things like um, somebody wanted to go in and purchase an existing single family home and convert it to a group home. This is the inclusionary housing because they're increasing the number of people living there and the number of bedrooms. Um, there's been property line adjustments um, that have um, created a new lot. Do you, how does that impact things? Um, and we had one developer that came in that he had platted um, townhomes and wanted to come in and change to um, small single family homes and was gonna have to have um, a plat revision which triggers inclusionary housing. Um, he wasn't increasing the number of units at all, um, exact same number of units, same, it's everything except for a different type of unit. Does that really trigger inclusionary housing? So some of those things we're gonna have to work through. The other thing that's been brought up is that um, right now the code requires um, donation of land to the city um, and de developers are more comfortable, at least right now, donating directly to Habitat or a, a nonprofit. So we're having to go and get council approval of those as opposed to just being able to approve that. So um, take a look at that. Do we have like a list of approved nonprofits that they can also donate to so we don't have to go to council every time? Why is that? Is it because of some tax benefit to them by going to a nonprofit instead of to the city or? Um, I think it's just they feel, um, well, they've, they've come in with the partnership already with the Habitat or Got the it. Veterans Community Project. That's really the two so far that have happened. Um, it just it seems kind of foolish to make them donate to the city, and then the city has to turn around and donate it to the nonprofit. So we got it. Just request your permission. And I'm trying to remember why the code was set up that way to begin with. I think our attorney's office wasn't comfortable with who might get a donation, uh, whether a um, sham nonprofit mm -hmm. might be set up by the developer to, to take it or something, and that's why they, you know, we ended up doing it to the city, but I think we can figure it out and work around, so. So that's that, unless there's other questions. I think this is just pictures, Fall River, New Vista, Micah. <coughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, let's throw it at you all at once. <laughs> it, it certainly illustrates the size of the issue. Not to have a great solution generation I got about 20 copies of the last page yeah, in our pack. Okay. <laughs> It was a little yes, accident. We, yes. <laughs> it was an accident. It's Nicole's fault. <laughs> no. I only got one. Ryan, Ryan, Ryan. <laughs> All right, so any questions for Kathy on the last presentation? Not to chew on. All right, well, thank you so much for putting that together for us. It was very helpful. on to discussing the role of the tech. We're not done yet. <laughs> right. Come um, discussing the role of the technical review group. We need a break. We need more good tea. Yeah, I'll bring that. <laughs> All right, so All right, so the oh, technical review yeah. <laughs> um, was started
started in 2002 um, to fill a need that the Housing Advisory Board felt at that time that there was, um, which is that they didn't feel they had the expertise as we were starting to get more and more into um, allocating funding for affordable housing projects, which are um, inherently more complex than our regular CDBG projects and um, um, and are, are different than the Human Service Agency funding that the, the group started out doing. So we've kind of added to the duties of this board and, and this was a result. So, um, <clears throat> so they didn't feel equipped to review um, the applications that we were getting and at that time, um, 18 years ago, um, staff was me a down payment assistance program person, and a brand new inclusionary housing um, person for the program in effect at the time. So we really didn't have um, much capacity in-house to, to um, conduct the reviews in depth. Um, and I think the Housing Advisory Board just felt somewhat overwhelmed and out of their depth. So um, it was decided to create the technical review group to review those and that the group would be formed with particular expertise that could review the applications um, and then make a recommendation for um, funding to the Housing Advisory Board. So if you remember, the technical review group includes um, housing builders um, or developers, <clears throat> the real, somebody from the real estate community, um, the banking and lending community, um, folks um, that either are low income or um, uh, organizations that serve that population and understand their needs, and then um, folks that either are special needs populations or serve special needs populations. So, <clears throat> so those are um, considered as well. Um, they're supposed to look at the experience and capacity of the developer. Um, the costs um, are the um, costs in line with other projects. Um, evaluation of the developer's fee, loan to value ratios, et cetera, the financial feasibility of the project, um, whether they have sufficient operating reserves, et cetera, and then conformance to um, our affordability requirements around the goals that we've set, priorities by income or type of unit, et cetera. <clears throat> then the Housing Advisory Board would review the recommendations of the TRG, um, and make a recommendation up to the council. Um, what has, I think, um, happened over the years is um, the we've tried to include the Housing Advisory Board so they didn't feel like they were just a rubber stamp of the TRG with the presentations. Um, those weren't always well attended. Um, it's, so it's been difficult to integrate I guess the work of the, the two groups. Um, and I have felt for the last couple of years, several years, that we haven't been getting the level of review and involvement that we need from the TRG. Um, and our staff capacity has increased um, significantly actually last year um, with the addition of our new inclusionary housing person who came from the development side. <clears throat> and then additional training that um, Molly, or one of our staff person, has undertaken in the last couple years as well. So um, <coughs> our applications have also gotten much more sophisticated and involved. We are mirroring, mirroring um, the Chaffa application and the um, Division of Housing, State Division of Housing application as well as the City of Boulder's application. So we have come a long way in what we're asking for as well. Um, so some of the things that I've noticed with the TRG is that um, questions and um, comments are very thoughtful, but they're not probing. Um, they seem to be accepting of the answers with not a lot of follow-up. Most of the follow-up is coming from staff. Um, and then the last project, this last couple quarters of uh, work that we were working on um, and analyzing um, was really all staff. So I don't know if you remember, I think you got this um, part of the packet that was included, if you remember. Um, I didn't make copies or anything, but um, 
<coughs> so where we put together the charts that compared um, the cost per unit, um, mm -hmm. the status, a summary of uh, the <coughs> tested, and then it also included the <coughs> use of funds <coughs> with the estimated cost per unit, the affordability levels, the number of bedrooms, um, and then the, the financial assessment um, and compared the projects um, on a cost basis, on a per unit subsidy basis, um, the replacement reserve basis, and some of the other factors um, around that. So <clears throat> that was um, all done by staff this time. Um, Had it been done by the TRG in the past? No, okay. no. Um, just a, another level of It's analysis. another level, so yes. So we, because of the capacity that we um, have with the addition of, of Heidi, we were able to take a look more, um, more of a deep dive. In the past, what we would do is just summarize the application um, for the TRG, and then um, when we have the presentations, we all have questions. We might identify additional things that we need from the applicants. Um, and staff gets those and, and presents it back to the TRG, and then um, we have recommendation um, discussions. So um, <coughs> we have tried to research what other communities have been doing around this issue, and that didn't really help us very much. Um, we either got no um, reply back or um, they're at a much lower sophistication level, I guess I would say, than, than we are. Um, we are going to attend a uh, City of Boulder TRG. They do have a TRG um, and operate kind of like we do. So we're gonna attend um, one of their meetings to see how their group functions, um, to see if our expectations might just be too high <laughs> or too low. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll definitely bring that information back. Um, but this is an analysis that we intended to do in 2019 and with in instituting the inclusionary housing program, we were doing all we could do to keep our heads above water and process the applications that we got in and keep things um, flowing. So, um, so we didn't get to the level of analysis that we wanted to. We haven't met with the TRG to get their thoughts as well, um, which I think we really need to have happen. Um, but um, as we move into that, and so, so one of my recommendations is going to be that we go ahead and reappoint for one year terms again um, so that we have 2020 to do this analysis and make some decisions moving forward but we thought this might be a good opportunity to talk through some of what your thoughts are and I know some of you are new and haven't been through this so um, but you still might have some idea of how you think the process um, currently works or should work um, <coughs> as we move forward. So I just kind of guess I wanted to throw out, one, do you have any follow-up questions before we do that? And then start throwing out a couple of questions for you guys, so. <coughs> Madeline, you've been on the board for a while. What are your thoughts about the TRG? I was just trying to remember. Uh, when it was originally uh, started or created, was it not has the role have has the role changed for TRG from from um, the beginning to now? No, it has not. Uh, were they not the group that were involved with that community forum where we had many sessions? We had a contractor come in, a consultant come in to do some assessment as it pertains to even how we uh, um, uh, allocated mm -hmm. funds. That they, was, that's that's a different group? Yep. Okay. Yep. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, are, you, are you looking for discussion or general input, or do you have questions that you want to say? Answer? Well, I mean, I certainly have thoughts. Yeah. So. so one of my questions was, what, what are some of the thoughts that you have about yeah. how the current process works? What kind of concerns do you have? Or what kind of benefits do you see from how it's operating right now? Yeah. Um, so as the person who currently sits on TRG as this board's liaison, um, I think TRG in its present form, um, admittedly I've only been on I think three funding cycles now, three quarters maybe. Yeah. Um, 
I think it is a very well constructed and important tool in how we evaluate affordable housing in the city of Long Island. Um, and that isn't to discredit staff. It isn't to say that staff wouldn't be capable. But the, the, the group of experts that you have, even if they aren't necessarily as engaged as maybe we would want them to be, I'm sure for most of them they review the applications and they come in ready to talk about it and that's about it. Um, the group of experts who sit around that table make me more knowledgeable as a person who lives in that city and I think make our outcomes on affordable housing far better. I don't know if you remember the last round of AHF applications that this board approved that, that of recommendations that came from TRG. That was a pretty detailed conversation that, that board had to come to a creative, what I thought was a creative solution, what I thought was the right solution to fund as many of those projects as possible that I don't believe would have been reached without that combination of people in the room. Um, you have experts who work with the, dis with the disabled community. You have experts who advocate in key areas of housing policy that I do not believe. Again, staff can, can take into con those things into consideration, certainly, but I do not believe would have an advocate in this process, especially the, the, dis the disability community, with, if not for TRG. Um, the financial expertise that that group provides is able to um, do some pretty remarkable things in the way they, they can just explain projects. Um, personally, I think, um, I, do th I do hear you about how to make it more relevant to this board, so that this board is not a rubber stamp. That's been my frustration as well, and, and you mentioned presentations. My one thought was that it would be helpful, I think, for this board to have those same presentations from developers that are given to TRG, given to this board as well, to make the developer or whoever's applying come in for a second time, maybe at a condensed version of that presentation, so that that board feels like they have a better, so that this board feels like you, they, there's a better understanding of what is being approved, because this board does not get all the information that TRG gets, certainly, um, which I think puts this board at a disadvantage, which is not the goal. The goal is for TRG to be a group of experts that can sit down and look at things and say, okay, you know, this is where it's at. Um, in terms of the staff ca capacity concerns, and staff now has the capacity to do this work, I agree. Staff could do a lot of what TRG does, but I think from a citizen, from, from, from a, I, I guess I view it a little bit differently than that. I view it as an opportunity for experts in the community to not only assist in doing the work, but to also say people who really understand this stuff and understand it at multiple different levels and to come together and say, okay, this is how, this is why this project makes sense, this is why this dollar amount makes sense, here's a red flag, here's a red flag. Um, are some of the questions that TRG asked maybe not as probing as maybe they should be, possibly, I, I, I hear that concern. Um, I would say that what is probing, or at least what has been in my opinion, has been the conversation that comes out of those presentations and especially in the last couple of meetings, the discussions that have happened at the table about you know, different, different pieces and different developments um, and how we can come to creative solutions on, on funding specifically <laughs> and what makes sense and what doesn't. I, I really believe that the city of Longmont would lose a great deal if TRG were removed or change is a different, I'm always open to having conversations about how something makes something better, but but eliminating TRG to me is, is, would be a mistake. And that's where I'm at with it. Well, how do they help, like Kathy, how do they help her, <coughs> TRG? Do they fill her in on everything that was talked about then? And so Kathy's in the room. Oh. Kathy's in the room for TRG meetings. Kathy's the one that brings typically the application to TRG. Um, I, I think it's less about helping, I mean, I think maybe the, the function initially was to help staff and to help staff kind of with the capacity issue. But I think when I look at TRG, what I see now is a different function. And the function that I see now is to evaluate these projects in ways that this board, I believe, still could not. And that isn't to discredit this board, it's just to say the blend of individuals that are on TRG can, can look at these things in a different way and provide different insights that this board maybe, um, because of timing, partly because we do a lot on this board over the course of the calendar year, doesn't have the ability to dive in in the way that TRG can. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think, I view it differently, I guess, in, in that I think I see their role as more of a, um, we're gonna put a bunch of really smart people in the room and, and figure out if this is a good project for Longmont or not, 
and then and then evaluate, especially on the financial side, evaluate whether this makes sense. And could staff, you know, do a lot of that work and make a recommendation to this board? Possibly. Um, I think the city would really miss out on the conversation that happens at that table in those quarterly meetings from individuals and admin, from individuals who work in these spaces. Well, it sounds like a community-based, community-based. Um, yeah, I mean that's one way to put it. So, are there what are the actual tangible results of the TRG that you see as positive beyond the conversation? So, uh, t uh, a good example would be, um, I think. The I'm trying to remember exactly how the last AHF round, what the final result was. But I think we included, like, we, we got creative, uh, TRG got creative and included um, home dollars in, in that, uh, in, in there, included, evaluated all sorts of different funding sources and came out with a solution that probably, I, I, at least I don't believe, this board would have reached and, and maybe necessarily s staff wouldn't have naturally come to, to begin with. And we were, because of that, we were able to fund more projects in, I think, ways that are ultimately beneficial to the city. Um, that That's one tangible impact. I also think, um, yeah, I think that that's probably the, it, it, I'd have to go back and look at exactly what our, what our, what the recommendation wound up being, go back and look at my notes, but, which I can do, but um, I think we, we gain, we get a great deal by having, um, by having that, that group review these applications and, and, and make a recommendation. And I, I hear you about the rubber stamp piece, though. Absolutely. I, I think this board can often serve as, as a rubber stamp in ways that maybe we shouldn't on affordable housing applications. And you know, I would just go back to saying one way to potentially address that is to power this board a little bit more and have developers come in and have conversations about their applications. Would be my one maybe recommended change. I don't know if that answered your question. I kind of, kind of went around in circle, but it, it is, um, it is a, um, in terms of tangible impact. I think we gain ex this board and I think <laughs> staff gain expertise from different segments of the community that aren't necessarily represented in the conversation all the time. Specifically, you know, there's a disability. There's somebody. Who, um, there's a disability advocate. There's also real estate experts and, and business folks and banker on, on the board. And all of that coming together is, I think, a, a unique process that serves the city well. Um, and I'll leave it at that. So, Karen and Caitlin, do you have thoughts on this or questions? Just it sounds like it's you don't think it's that important or. I wouldn't say important. I'm just wasted energy, or well, we hope we would get more more out of it engagement from them. I guess um, around it. So I guess I, one question I would throw back to you is, and what do you think we could do to improve it? My question would be membership um, on TRG. How often do those members rotate it? I mean, it's been a while for a lot of them to sit on TRG, right? Yeah. That would be my one thought, is does it make sense to maybe look at trying to look to some new folks who may be a little bit more ready to engage? Um, just natural, if you've been doing something for a long time, you might not necessarily be as engaged with it as you were at the beginning. Because um, I, I do hear that. I, I do hear that concern. Uh, so okay. can, if, if we hold on to that question for just a moment, would Grant, what are your, do you have any thoughts you want to add before we uh, yeah, I guess two maybe. Uh, one is, I think that it should just be communicated directly and clearly to that group uh, if the expectation is different than what they're performing and give them the opportunity to bridge the gap. You know, um, I think that's that's critical. Um, and then second of all, I, I just have a curiosity about the fact that this board is both housing and human services, and I'm wondering if, if what <coughs> you're wanting from the TRG is sort of its own advisory board, and if that occurs in other municipalities, or you know, um, if they're always combined in this way. You know, so. yeah. That housing and human services, or housing, yeah, housing and human services reflects the fact that Boulder County has combined housing and human services. I think because so many of the things that affect human services are affected by housing. Um, so like I know 
like I volunteer with an organization and one of the things we've talked about is the fact that like the Coffin Street building is, you know, has housing and human, like those things go hand in hand for so much of our community because housing is like one of the biggest challenges for obtaining, you know, it's that idea of like, if you don't have stable housing, it's really hard to show up at like mental health appointments or get help with food if you don't have state, like, so those things just seem like so <coughs> intertwined in our community in particular, that it seems like the county, at the county level at least, they've combined those. I don't know if that's the reason this board does those two things, but I see them as like very like interlinked um, in our community. Um, it is the reason why both services are combined on this board, but it, we did that before. I know that there is information that TRG gets that this board does not necessarily get when it comes to AHF applications, specifically on the financial side, right? Or does this board get everything that, that, that I TRG gets? I don't believe gets? this last I'm trying to think. Do they get the year, full financial I package? So. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't know if I recall that. But I, I don't I, remember either. Do yeah, the truth? I think... <laughs> So for some reason, I'm, I'm under my... I know I, the application for sure, I thought... I, I, think, I, we, I think we... Not the audits. I don't the think audits we did is the what audits I'm thinking and all that of, yeah. Well, there was a the link. Or and all right. that. <coughs> that. We provided a link because that's a truckload of yeah, information. Truckload so of I stuff. think for members that were just really excited about yeah. diving into all the details, I think we made that link available yeah. as I recall. So. But what, what I will say is TRG like actively has conversations about those options <coughs> and has conversations about the financial side mm -hmm. in a way that this board does not and maybe we could, I don't know. Um, I, would, I, I don't believe that our conversation, just because of the way that that board is structured, would be quite as in-depth or insightful as what happens there. There are questions that get asked in, in those meetings that I would never think of just because I'm not in that space. Um, and you know, I think I, I hear I hear the, the the two concerns about engagement and about um, the rubber stamp piece for sure. I think I think talking I think that's the first step. And Graham is right. Communicating to the board that staff is not necessarily satisfied with with what TRG is putting out I think would be the first step, and then see kind of where that puts us and. Um, Go from go from there. I think it's an ongoing conversation rather than a. You know, I, I I just I still believe that kind of the and just maybe it, it might be helpful for those who are new, to kind of like what is all this to just kind of know kind of how TRG typically happens. Um, there's a you know, Kathy sends out you know the Kathy sends out applications. We have a quarterly meeting that's on the calendar. Uh, we come in, um, they come in, they look at. Uh, the developer actually is physically present to present to TRG, um, and there are questions that can be asked. There's a back and forth there that can take place um, that does not happen here, and that is that I think is a missing point. Um, and then there's the there's a conversation piece where we relate, you know, the, the funding, you know, what's available in terms of dollars, and what we can fund, what different requests are. Um, so that it's it, it's. A little, it's a very kind of, it's an in-depth process in a way that I think it's more benefits. So, so, so I think just if I can comment, so I think, yeah. you know, because I'm also, <coughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, just to be thinking about, so as, as Kathy laid out, when we first started the TRG, which has probably been 15, 18 years ago, yeah. it really was to bolster um, and Staff. bring in yeah. more technical expertise. Um, in mm -hmm. the whole finance and mm -hmm. housing development and, mm -hmm. and whatever. And so so that's really what we really need the TRG for. There was other precedent for, for that. We looked at, I think, um, City of Boulder had a technical review group or whatever. And so over time, we've been able to build that capacity with that staff, which is good. Mm -hmm. And what we have heard from, the, um, from previous advisory boards is like, you know, hey, we, we feel disconnected so, you know, there's a TRG, they do this, they come back, and, um, and so, yeah. and then we kind of rubber stamp that. So, so, so those are really some questions. So how do we have more opportunities to integrate? Yeah. Could, you know, should we be having more joint meetings? Should we be doing, you know, meeting as a group? Should we be recruiting and directing more specific expertise 
in the advisory board to bring that mm -hmm. instead of having a separate board? Do we, you know, because some of the city advisory boards and commissions, like the Master Board of Appeals, okay, whatever, so requires some specific expertise in order for you to apply to be on that board. So there's a variety of, of options. We just think after yeah. 18 years, um, and our council had questioned that, so that we probably should be just taking a peek at this. <laughs> and it might be that we do the same thing as we've done in the past, yeah. or there could be some enhancements that we do in, in, a, in a lot of different so, yeah. ways. Yeah. Well, well, I think kind of to that point, what I'd love to hear is, so it sounds like staff um, capacity in a bunch of areas has increased. One of the things I heard in terms of the expertise that we're looking for on the TRG is folks that are, folks themselves are low income or organizations that serve that as well as like special needs populations. Um, and whether there's a way, like are those, what are the things that, um, you know, that staff doesn't have the capacity for um, or doesn't you know have the the lens to look at it? What are the gaps of that? And like really understanding where are the way what are the ways like the TRG could really supplement what the staff expertise Correct. is so now? That might be what, what's a different set of expectations? Yeah, what's a refined mm -hmm. set of expectations. Because if staff has more like experience on the financing side or on something else, then maybe we need less of that and more of right. the other community input mm -hmm. that staff doesn't have. But really understanding like. If, if they're the same, that doesn't necessarily help us, unless it's a, like... So what additional value can the technical review group bring to the yeah. process yeah. so that we really have the best recommendations and review of those, and leverage of those dollars? That's a great question and a great thought. My, my one hesitation, and this, is, and this is not to say ill of anybody, of any staff in this room at all, and Kathy and Karen and Alberto, Nicole are all wonderful. I, I hesitate any time that, whether it's us at the state or my day job or any time that, you know, kind of co community is handing more to staff. And that, that, isn't, that isn't just about capacity, it's also about community voices being involved in the process and different voices from the outside being able to speak on policy and being able to speak on different elements of it. So I think if there's a way to, to to address your concerns, Kathy, and staff's concerns about the functionality of TRG, while still maintaining that element of it, where you do have experts who do not get involved and who, who, who would otherwise, communities that would otherwise not have a voice in this process, have a voice in it, um, exactly to your question, which I think is a great one, um, how we get there is, a, is something I'm absolutely interested in pursuing. I just, um, I think, because I, I hear you, I think on the finance side, staff really, in my experience on TRG is a pretty good handle on most of on most of all of that. Um, there, there are certainly pieces that I think would be lost. So um, I'm going to yeah, for one moment yeah, and yeah, then yeah, recognize yeah. myself just to make sure <laughs> before it gets too late. Yeah. Um, so in my experience, the this board I think is functioning at the level it should be functioning in relation to these, and that is. These are questions of purpose, right? So for me, I see the purpose of this board is to understand how these projects are fitting <coughs> into the strategic, comprehensive plan and fulfilling those goals. So the numbers you presented today are very important to us because it shows how are we moving towards the goals of having sufficient housing using these different tools. TRG performs a role that is very specific uh, it is technical, and I think it's going to be hard for us to incorporate that on this board and get through the rest of our business. So TRG's purpose to me is one of uh, evaluating these projects. Are they meeting, are the projects meeting the needs that they're stating they're needed? Are they the ones that we're saying we need? Can they be enhanced? Are they uh, doing it to their maximum capacity? Are they financially solvent enough? And, so they, yeah, all of those yeah. questions. That, and I do like the idea of there being a community lens because I think what I hear you saying, Jake, is that uh, I think it matters to have somebody that represents a disabled community there saying, if you're going to be doing housing that, that accommodates these individuals, I can represent that interest. Or 
transitioning homeless or whatever it is, right? And, um, and I think that is a valuable role. And then staff, of course, needs to hold all of it, right? Staff is responsible for not only evaluation, but also implementing and make sure it actually happens. But in, in the way that TRG is saying, is it maximized? Can't we enhance it? Are there things, perspectives we can bring, the lenses, and you know, that should be helpful to staff. If it's not, I think that's the real kind of teaser in there to mm -hmm. say, why is it not? And, and I think your experience with this other board will help you understand. Um, but again, to me, it's all an issue of purpose. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering if TRG's purpose has become a little vague. So maybe redefining or restating or, the yeah, purpose. Re, it, it um, might be, you know, getting remarried, right? It's, it's, <laughs> uh, let's just reaffirm our vows. We're, oh. we're here. Because, oh, that kind of remarried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not the second yeah, marriage, yeah, yeah. but the uh, a uh, renew, uh, renewal so, of renew vows. Renew your yeah. vows. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> because sometimes I think that can focus groups. I was going to, I think one of the things I was going to ask is staff has a lot of expertise and you mentioned that it felt like a lot of the questions, sort of the most probing questions were coming from staff versus from TRG members. Um, I'm curious, just in your experience, do you feel like TRG members will push back on staff and to give you maybe perspectives that you're not seeing or do they take what staff says as like you're an ex, you know, I think about in my day job, I'm like, I work with people who are really technical, and the people who make me better at my job are the ones who are like, I'm not sure you're doing this right. How do we improve it? Is there not, is that not happening? Is that where you feel like you could get be getting more of like staff and the, that board pushing each other to really get to serve this purpose of, you know, that um, Brian laid out of what this board is doing. What I hear you saying is that maybe they're not pushing that, and is it that, I mean, I, I feel like maybe that's a question of like, do they feel empowered to do that? Or do they think that, you know, you all have it in hand? Or is there some some understanding there where they're not pushing those questions? Yeah, I, I'd like to um, get your thoughts on, uh, well, for me personally, I'd like to attend one of the meetings, one of their sessions, so that I can update myself with what they're doing today because um, it has been a long time, um, just to, to become current on, on the processes and how they operate and what the roles are. You mentioned the community being an entity of that group. Is it? Well, I, I think when I say community, what I mean by that is different voices from different segments of the community. Of the community. Uh -huh. of the, not necessarily a, you know, just general community, but Somebody from First Bank, somebody right, from Banker disability enough. community, yeah, somebody right. who would not Developer otherwise look blah, blah, blah. at, you know, yeah. that's what I what I say when I mean community is, yeah. is is those different outside voices being involved in, in that process. Would it be, in your opinion, Jake? Would it be uh, beneficial for us to attend? So I think that's uh, so. First of all, I think sure, um, but I think it's a question for staff of whether that's okay or not. Absolutely. I mean, that's why we have the liaison, really, is to serve yeah, as that board. kind of go between. But absolutely, I mean, we've talked about that having, and we have had joint meetings. Yes, about yeah. more okay. around goals and strategic direction, mm -hmm. um, and then trying to have the presentations jointly. Right. right. Yeah. Right. yeah. What are we scheduled for two? Two. We're kind of up in the air yeah. because yeah, yeah. yeah. we gave away some. So much money. That was the other thing. Is, so much money. That was the other thing. Is we weren't sure because <laughs> so much of our probably was three. Yeah, I, I'm thinking May or June. <coughs> so yeah, in theory, we wouldn't be able to come back till May or June. But I, I think it'd be very beneficial, especially for folks who don't know or have questions, right. to see kind of how that group functions, and, and additionally to see what areas could can be improved. Because I hear you on the questions piece, especially, and, yeah. and I think I think there are definitely improvements that can be made. It's just a matter of. You know, does a full reshaping need to happen or not? Yeah, how do we know when the next? How do we get the meeting schedule, or can we be invited to? Uh, yeah. Okay. <coughs> can you just do it as a joint meeting? You were going to make a comment or before that. <coughs> Did you give the feedback that you needed? Um, yes, or I think. Or maybe not that you wanted. <coughs> <coughs> no, I think. Um, I think we just kind of have to take a look at um, having all things on the table. Um, 
one of the things that other communities have done is made their <coughs> um, advisory board that board. So in effect, putting that expertise on, on the advisory board, then it becomes a matter of can you do everything um, as a volunteer board. Um, the other thing, option, is that sometimes they split them out. Um, so housing becomes one and, yeah, but then you lose that integration without some more um, specific integration and also what might that look like, so. Just on the calendar, is there enough housing work? I mean, I guess in theory we could fill work, but just based on the way the funding is, is structured and the schedule of that, um, is there you know, enough work to do for just a housing board? Mm -hmm. Well, they might not meet, meet monthly, monthly, right? It might be just still quarterly or once every other month. Yeah, something. So, so everything's really kind of, <coughs> this is yeah. what we need to do. I, you yeah. know, feedback has been really great. Um, so we just need to. I think it would give me an understanding more of what, yeah. I, what's I, all of, what's all involved in this. And I think you know, I'm still kind of unclear exactly what we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, and I think, I, I for me at least, I, it was amazing. Like the first, and, and maybe, maybe uh, you know, it just I haven't been there long enough. But just watching these very, very smart people who are way smarter than I am put their brains on stuff and figure it out is um, something that I think everybody should, should get a chance to be a part of at least once. So, yeah, I, think, I think that whatever the next meeting is, this board should be a part of it if this is going to be an ongoing question. So I just want to clear. Can we, uh, Madeline, are you okay with doing your presentation, your walkthrough of your site visit next meeting? Sure. Rather than this one, so we sure. don't too late. Is that okay with you? Yeah, okay. Totally fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so let's table that until the next meeting. I, I would just strongly suggest that there we explore a crystal clear purpose for that group. Mm -hmm. and how that relates to our purpose because, I, again, I think there's some vagueness happening. And I'm guessing that all these groups can contribute much better if we know exactly how we're going to add value to the work you do and to the community. Um, okay, is there any other business? We were, uh, did I miss the photo session? No. Yeah, the I photo session, you... Oh, I'm sorry, you weren't here. No, no I missed it. No, you didn't miss it. <laughs> we haven't done that yet. Now. Okay, all right. Yeah. Uh, but now that life's getting longer, right? And we're all going to be inside, and, and, inside and the west months. entrance yeah. is now remodeled. <laughs> okay, so if there is no other business, uh, is there a movement to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Uh, so moved. Second. Second. Awesome. We are adjourned. Thank you.